get started. I'd just like to welcome all of you here tonight uh, for the second debate in our three-part series between Swan Sona and Tai Niki. Uh, correct. I say it every. I say it different every other time. I still apologize when I get it wrong. So Tai Niki and Swan Sona. I'm Father Gail Hammerschmidt. Uh, we're just going to continue right on as, as we did with the debate last uh, two weeks ago. We're going to change the format just a touch. The touch would be this. We're going to start with 20-minute opening statements as we did uh, previously. We would then go to 10-minute rebuttals. But instead of the cross-examination, we're going to have a 30-minute dialogue. We'll see how that goes. Uh, it's more of a dialogue where it's not kind of back and forth like exchanging uh, upper hands, and if an upper hand's a real thing, I mean, I'm, sorry, I'm not a boxing enthusiast, but uh, just a conversation. I think, I think it's important to do that. Uh, here at St. Isidore's, we frequently would say to people that we feel that we have a very important role for the future of the faith throughout the state of Kansas. We, we strive to form students here and then send them into communities throughout Kansas and really throughout the Midwest. And so therefore it's also important for us to, to, to strive to, to form our students even in, in ways of interreligious dialogue or, or interdenominational dialogue. Uh, we didn't uh, in, invite this debate to take place because we're so angry at the other side. No, it's because we want to try to, to understand where our brothers and sisters are, our, our brothers and sisters who love the Lord very much where they're coming from, and, and maybe help them to see where we're coming from, why we believe what we believe, and try to understand more deeply why uh, our brothers and sisters believe slightly differently than us, believe the way they believe it. And so Swan and Ty are, are really wonderful at, at helping us have our eyes open in such a way. So again, very grateful to the, the both of you for being here. I do ask that maybe we just bow our head in prayer. Call upon the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come tonight. Grant us the spirit of wisdom. Give us your knowledge. Help us to see. Help us to know. Help us to love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, just uh, nobody really wants to hear me speak. Nobody came here to hear me tonight. So I'm just going to head right into the uh, bios of both Swan and Ty. Uh, I'll start with, with Swan. Swan will be on the affirmative tonight as he argues for the papacy, and then Ty will, will follow Swan. So we start with Swan Sona, who is a third-year philosophy student, Kansas State University, a convert to the Catholic faith. Uh, Swan is currently has currently one paper published by Cornell University and another paper concerning the Jewish roots of the papacy under review in the academic journal. He's a, a member here at St. Isidore's Catholic Student Center as well. Ty uh, Ninki has an undergraduate degree from Kansas State University in agricultural education, currently pursuing a Master of Arts in Practical Ministry from Heartland School of Ministry. Uh, perhaps, not perhaps, most importantly, Ty has been married to his wife, Michaela, <laughs> one year now and currently lives and works here in Manhattan. He's part of the Refugee Fellowship Church. So let's welcome both Swan and is it, do I keep saying refugee? Uh, so appalled, I'm so appalled. You know, last time I heard, I, I heard the Snickers and I was like, what did I do wrong? Uh, refuge, I deeply appalled. We're all refugees, we're all refugees. We're all refugees. So, the Refuge Fellowship Church, is that right? Bless you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome Ty and Swan. All right, let me see. All right, does that can everybody hear me? Does it does sound good? Okay, let me get my timer started. All right, well, let me begin by thanking everybody for coming out to this second debate. It's been very good to see Ty again and to see everybody back. Also, I didn't recognize this at the time, but I looked at my outfit, and I looked like a Ray Liotta from Goodfellas. Uh, so I didn't intend to dress up like an Italian mobster, but hey, we're talking about the Italians tonight, so why not? 
Tonight I'm going to argue that Christ established a successional pet shrine ministry that is supreme and infallible. Let me briefly focus on those last two points. Papal supremacy is the doctrine that, one, the Pope has authority over the entire church because he is the vicar or earthly representative of Christ. Second, the Pope has the power to define doctrine alone and by divine right command the obedience of the people to his irreformable teachings. Now, papal infallibility is the doctrine that when the Pope teaches, not as the bishop of or only over Rome, but ex cathedra, as the supreme pastor of the entire church, on matters concerning faith and morals, then God will protect him from error. It is not the idea that he is never wrong or is morally perfect. I want to stress that although the papacy is built upon the person of Peter, it more fundamentally rests upon the identity of Jesus. Scripture clearly teaches that Jesus is the new Adam, the new Moses, and the new David, because he is the Messiah. For instance, Moses anticipates in Deuteronomy 18.15 that, quote, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, for your countrymen to whom you shall listen. God promises David in 2 Samuel 7, 8-14, that one of David's sons will establish David's kingdom and throne forever, and that this son will also be God's son. We read in Luke 1, 32-33, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Even the word Messiah itself literally means anointed one, which denotes that the Messiah will be a king and a prophet or priest, as all were anointed in ancient Israel. Thus, I'm going to defend three claims tonight. One, Peter is the new Eliakim, meaning he is the prime minister of Christ's Davidic kingdom. Second, Peter is the new Joshua, meaning he is seated on the throne of Moses. Third, Peter's successors are the bishops of Rome. First, Peter is the new Eliakim. In Matthew 16, 19, Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, 19 is a typological parallel of Isaiah 22, 22, where God replaces Shebna, a corrupt prime minister, with Eliakim. Then I will put the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. There are at least six reasons why this parallel is valid. First, there's a similar structure. God gives the keys of a kingdom to a person whose decisions are secured by God's promise. Second, Peter and Eliakim received keys to similar kingdoms. The kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, and David's kingdom become one reality in the New Testament, because Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of David. Christ's authority spans both heaven and earth. Eliakim receives the keys of David's kingdom, and Peter receives the keys of Christ's kingdom. To quote from Dan, uh, David Turner's commentary on Matthew, <clears throat> Jesus also speaks of Peter as custodian of the keys of the kingdom. The linking of the foundation and key metaphors indicates that one cannot divorce the church and the kingdom, and that the church is the agency that extends the kingdom on the earth. Okay, let me pause real quick to switch out my... Uh, my uh, yeah, batteries. Can receive similar powers. Recall that binding and loosing represent the power of the rabbis to interpret scripture and discipline the community. God tells Peter that the exercise of his rabbinic authority will be backed by God, meaning his official rulings cannot be challenged. Likewise, God promises that whatever Eliakim opens, no one can shut, and whatever he shuts, no one can open. Here, it will be worth noting what the function of the keys are. The keys represent the power of the prime minister, or master of the palace, to open the palace to others and serve as second in command to the king. In the NIV Cultural Background Bible, quote, In the biblical period, locks were quite large and required a correspondingly large and heavy bronze or iron key. When Eliakim was given this key, its size and probably its elaborate decoration 
would serve as a physical symbol of its authority to lock and unlock the rooms and gates of the palace in Jerusalem. The New Bible Commentary adds, quote, Shutting and opening mean the power to make decisions which no one under the king could override. In his book, Ancient Israel, Its Life and Institutions, archaeologist Roland DeVoe writes, quote, All the affairs of the land passed through his hands. All important documents received his seals. All officials were under his orders. Like the Egyptian vizier, the master of the palace was the highest official in the state. His name, Eliakims, comes first in the list of 2 Kings 18.18. 18. He alone appears with the king in 1 Kings 18.3, and Jotham bears this title when he acts as regent of the kingdom, 2 Kings 15.5, as the vizier did in the absence of the pharaoh. Fourth, Peter and Eliakim both appear first on the list of their king's royal cabinet. Recall in 2 Kings 18.18, 18, Eliakim appears first on the list of the king's royal cabinet. Peter's name also comes first in every list of the disciples. Matthew 10.2 even calls Peter first, or protos, which is meant, quote, not just first on the list, but a privileged status. Judas, the most dishonored, is last. That's from the Presbyterian scholar Dale Allison in the Oxford Bible Commentary. Lest there be any question, Peter and the apostles are certainly treated as Christ's royal cabinet. For instance, Christ promises the disciples 12 thrones from which they will judge Israel, Matthew 19.28 and Luke 22.30. Solomon, a son of David, appointed 12 governors over Israel, 1 Kings 4, 7. 5. Peter and Eliakim are compared to secure objects. Eliakim is likened to a firm peg, although it will one day fall, Isaiah 22, 25. Peter, however, is the rock of Christ's church in Matthew 16, 18. This has been the consensus of scholars since the late 70s, not just among Protestants, but also Catholics and Orthodox, agnostics and Jewish scholars. For instance, Charles Talbert's 2010 commentary on Matthew, quote, At the end of a detailed history of research, Joseph Burgess, 1976, concludes that opinion has shifted toward identification of Peter, not Christ or Peter's faith, with the Petra in 1618. The decisive argument seems to be that in certain Jewish circles, Abraham was regarded as the rock on which Yahweh built the old congregation. Isaiah 51, 1-2 and the Yaquit Shimoni 1766 on Numbers 23.9, that's an old midrash. Likewise, the 1985 Encyclopedia Britannica, quote, Though in the past some authorities have considered that the term rock refers to Jesus himself or to Peter's faith, the consensus of the great majority of scholars today is that the most obvious and traditional understanding should be construed, namely, that rock refers to the person of Peter. Thus, the 1995 Theological Dictionary of the New Testament concludes, Roman Catholic exegesis is right, and all Protestant attempts to evade this interpretation are to be rejected. That was written by a Protestant scholar, Oscar Kuhlman. Finally, scholars recognize the parallel. In the 1970 New Bible Commentary, quote, the phrase in Matthew 16, 19 is almost certainly based on Isaiah 22, 22, where Shebna the steward is displaced by Eliakim, and his authority is, a transfer, is transferred to him. The Protestant scholar Craig L. Blomberg in the 2007 commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament writes, the keys of the kingdom, 1619, are almost certainly based on the identical metaphor in Isaiah 22, 22. Patrick Gray, in the 2017 Rutledge Guidebook to the New Testament writes, in the symbolism of the keys, many scholars discern an allusion to the ancient Israelite practice of a king granting authority to a prime minister, who, as holder of the key of the house of David, is deputized to make binding decisions on his behalf. So, where do we get papal succession? The keys can be passed to successors. Before Eliakim, there were Shebna, Azra, 1 Kings 16.9, Jotham, 15.5, and Ahishar, 4.6. How about supremacy? Well, the prime minister is second in command to the king, and no one under him can overrule his decisions. Whoever claims Jesus is their Messiah or King must by consequence recognize Peter as their Prime Minister. Peter would thereby be the Prime Minister of every Christian and have universal jurisdiction. As Roland Debo explained, the Davidic Prime Minister could rule when the King was absent. In that sense, then, he is the King's Vicar. Jesus said in John 16, 7, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I am leaving. For if I do not leave, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I argue that Peter's prime ministerial powers kicked in clearly after the ascension of Christ. Now, how about papal infallibility? 
As I noted last time, the Erdman's Commentary in the Bible and the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary explain that to say that one's binding and loosing is backed by heaven is to express a divine endorsement or divine ratification of those rulings. Let us now turn to John 21, 15 and 19, where I will argue that Peter is the new Joshua. Recall that in this passage, Jesus reinstates Peter into service and hands him three kinds of sheep with the order to feed them. There are three reasons why Peter is the new Joshua. First, Peter and Joshua are both the primary disciples of their master. The ancient rabbinic sources note that Joshua was the primary disciple of Moses compared to the others. Josephus even uses the same Greek word for disciple, Bethetes, that the New Testament uses to label the disciples, including Peter. And remember, Josephus is a historian alive during the time of Jesus and who witnessed the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Peter and Joshua received their flocks under similar contexts. Jesus calls Peter Simon, son of John, in verse 15. Just as Deuteronomy 34, 9 says, Moses filled Joshua, son of Nun, with the Spirit. Christ tells Peter in verse 18 that someone will put, gird, or wrap a belt on you as an allusion to his death. Just as in Jewish tradition, Moses is described as being wrapped, girded, and veiled before his death and before picking Joshua as his successor. Sifra Pinhas 139 and Numbers 27, 19. The strongest evidence, however, is that Peter and Joshua received the same three sheep. In the Avot of Rabbi Natan, a rabbi alive during the mid-second century, Moses hands to Joshua, quote, the smaller ones, the bigger older sheep, and the young strong sheep. In John 21, 15 to 17, Jesus begins with the little lambs or sucklings, proceeds to the young sheep, and ends with older, fully mature sheep. Although Jesus represents the sheep with a progression of age, they are nonetheless the same kind that Moses hands to Joshua in Jewish tradition during the time or around the early church. Thus, Roger David Oss, a Lutheran scholar, concludes, Jesus, the good shepherd of John 10, grants Simon Peter in 2115-17 the authority to be his successor in feeding and tending the Christian community. He is to be their spiritual leader, nourishing them in the faith. Furthermore, in Jewish tradition during the time of Jesus, it was believed that Moses handed his throne to Joshua. Oss writes, The Testament of Moses, Sifra Pinhas 140 on Numbers 2719, and the Petzrat Moshe, each attests that Joshua received Moses' throne. Oss therefore concludes, Hellenistic and Palestinian Jewish Christians may have conceived, considered Peter then as sitting on the throne of Moses. This is a Protestant Lutheran scholar. I want to address some preliminary objections before I continue. Ty said last time, we don't know what the throne of Moses is in Matthew 23, 2-3, and he cited both D.A. Carson and F.F. Bruce. Well, I tracked down the D.A. Carson source, and here's what D.A. Carson says. This is in his commentary on Matthew in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, page 471-472. to These leaders sit in Moses' seat. E.L. Sukenik uh, acknowledges or has shown that synagogues had a stone seat at the front, where the authoritative teacher, usually a Prometria, sat. Moreover, to sit on X's seat often means to succeed X. Exodus 11.5, 12.29, 1 Kings 135, 46, 2.12, 16, 11, 2 Kings 15, 12, Psalm 132, 12, and then he cites the antiquities of the Jews. Last sentence in the paragraph. This would imply that the teachers of the law are Moses' legal successors, possessing all his authority, a view the scribes themselves held. Midrashim Sanhedrin 11.3, Eclus 45, 15-17, Midrashim Aboth 1.1, and Midrashim Yebamah 2.4.9.3. Carson is clear that there is not confusion among scholars on what the throne of Moses is. And if you know, Dave Carson is one of the leading evangelical Protestant scholars in America. Now, another question you could ask is, why should we include Jewish traditions in our interpretation of Scripture? Well, one is that I could cite D.A. Carson's example, since he cites ancient extra-biblical Jewish sources in order to understand what the throne of Moses is. And this is standard practice among New Testament scholars. But in fact, Jewish traditions appear in the Bible. For instance, in Jude 1.9, it describes how Michael and Satan fought over Moses' body after he had died. Now, how many of you remember reading that in the Old Testament? Moses and Satan fighting over, or excuse me, uh, 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 was it uh, uh, the angel and Satan fighting over Moses' body? That's not in the Bible. That is a Palestinian Jewish tradition dated 200 years before the New Testament, and it appears in the canonical scriptures. So let me remind you that during the time of Jesus, the Old Testament canon was not closed. 
Only the Pentateuch was settled, the first five books of the Torah. Oral tradition and other sources of authority had authority among the people and found their way into the Bible. With those preliminary objections addressed, let me finish my argument. I believe that Peter exercises the throne of Moses in Acts 5 when he rebukes Ananias and Sapphira. Remember in Herbert Baxter and Marsha Cohen's book, The Gospel of Matthew and Judean Traditions, they note that Moses established the high court of the throne of Moses in Deuteronomy 17. In verse 12 to 13 of that passage, we see this. As for anyone who presumes to disobey the priest, appointed to minister there to the Lord your God, or the judge, that person shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. All the people will hear and be afraid, and will not act presumptuously again. In Acts chapter 5, Peter rebukes Ananias and Sapphira, and both times they both fall dead. And then in Acts 5, verse 5 and verse 11, it says this, Great fear seized all who heard of it. Great fear seized the whole, the whole church and all who heard these things. Walter Kaiser and F.F. F. Bruce and other scholars note in the hard sayings of the Bible that Peter's binding and loosing powers here are the most dramatically and immediately endorsed by God in Scripture. I believe this clearly implies that Peter had special authority. Now, include my Acts 5 argument with Roger David Oss's scholarship for Peter being the new Joshua, and we see it is highly plausible that Peter received the throne of Moses. So, where do we get papal succession? Remember that the rabbis could share their binding and loosing powers with successors through the laying on of hands. I cited the scholar uh, Alfred Edersheim, the Jewish convert to Christianity, and moreover, the Oxford companion to the Bible. What about supremacy? Well, if Peter's the new Joshua, then he becomes head shepherd of the church, which Ty recognized last time as the new Israel. Moreover, we know that under Jewish law, if the head rabbi, the Nasi, was not present at a council, then that council had no authority. Christopher Stenbo, in the Peace Commentary on the Bible, and A. Edward Shetensky, in the Papacy and the Orthodox, note that Peter is portrayed in the New Testament as head or supreme rabbi. For infallibility, remember what I've already said about binding and loosing, and how dramatically and immediately God backs Peter's use of those powers. Or even recall in my last debate how if Scripture is infallible because they are God-breathed, then so too must the apostles, since Jesus, God incarnate, breathed on them. John 20, 22. I remember last time Ty tried to respond to this argument by saying, well, the same Greek word isn't used there. But for instance, if I said David is a God-fearing man and David feared God, the two are the same idea, even if I don't use the same exact adjective, God-fearing. I think the same holds up in John 20, 22. Let me co close by talking about two reasons why Rome matters. First, the early church did not question that the successors of Peter are the bishops of Rome. Lutheran scholar Marcus Bachmuel, professor of New Testament studies at Oxford University, writes in his book, Simon Peter in Scripture and Memory, quote, The remembered Peter's profile in the second and subsequent centuries includes a recognition that his Petrine ministry was entrusted to a continuing succession of ecclesial shepherds in various places of his activity, including Antioch, but above all, in Rome. This continues to make it permissible and appropriate to speak of successors of Peter, even after the Reformation. The principle of continuation of the Petrine ministry as such seems clear in the memory of the man, beginning perhaps with the classic Petrine primacy text, such as Matthew 16, 17 to 19, Luke 22, 31 to 32, and John 21, 15 to 17. All three texts imply a post-Easter continuation of Peter's task that seems intrinsically permanent in nature and not tied to the identity of the one apostle. Once again, this is a Protestant Lutheran scholar who acknowledges that Peter has successors to his ministry in Rome. Second, the Jews believed that when the Messiah would come, he would conquer Rome. Just as Moses delivered Israel from Egypt, the Jews believed that the Messiah, quote, will redeem his people from subjugation to the last of the four kingdoms, Rome. This is once again from Roger David Oss. I want to close by saying this. As Christians, we literally live in the new Davidic monarchy. Because if Christ is your king, if he's the son of David, if he's your Messiah, then you live as a citizen of Israel. The church is the new Israel. If Jesus can see a pope in Peter, even with his flaws and limitations, imagine what he sees in you, a royal son and daughter of God. The Messiah indeed conquered Rome and placed his prime minister there. That's why we're Roman Catholics. Now let me emphasize at the end of my speech that as you assess tonight's debate, 
I know that Ty's going to raise up some arguments that, well, Peter doesn't seem to exercise supremacy. He doesn't seem to be a pope. But we have to consider, yes, Peter on his own might not be all that impressive. Peter on his own is just a Galilean fisherman. But how does Jesus see Peter? If you notice in my arguments tonight, I based my arguments not on what Peter says about himself, not on what any church father necessarily said about Peter, but how Jesus saw Peter. And that's the question for us tonight. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And now we'll turn to Ty for his 20-minute opening statement. It's quite amazing, Swan, that you always finish literally right at that time. <laughs> That's actually super impressive. And um, no worries on calling us the refugees. You're right, Father Gail, we are refugees, but we're a refuge of them, so it works well. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you to Father Gale for hosting as well as St. Isidore's. Thank you, Swan, for your wonderful opening statement. Tonight, as you know, we'll be evaluating the claims made by Rome regarding the papacy and determining the legitimacy of those claims. First off, we must understand the, clone, the claims excuse me, that Rome makes. In order to do so, I'll read to you from Vatican I, the 20th Council of the Roman Catholic Church taking place in 1869 to 1870. It reads as follows. Buckle up, because it'll be just a bit. <laughs> in order, then, that the Episcopal office should be one and undivided, and that by the union of the clergy, the whole multitude of believers should be held together in the unity of faith and communion, Jesus said, blessed Peter, over the rest of the apostles, and instituted in him the permanent principle of both unities and the visible foundation. This doctrine is to, be, is to be believed and held by all the faithful in accordance with the ancient and unchanging faith of the whole church. We teach and declare that, according to the gospel evidence, a primacy of jurisdiction over the whole church of God was immediately and directly promised to the blessed Apostle Peter and conferred on him by Christ the Lord. It was to Simon alone, to whom he had already said, You are Cephas, when he then said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father and his who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And it was to Peter alone that Jesus, after his resurrection, confided the jurisdiction of supreme pastor and ruler of his whole fold, saying, from John 21, as Swan showed us, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. To this absolutely manifest teaching of the scriptures, as it has always been understood by the Catholic Church, we are clearly opposed to the distorted opinions of those who misrepresent the form of government which Christ the Lord established in his church, and we deny that Peter, in preference to the rest of the apostles, was endowed by Christ with a true and proper primacy of jurisdiction. Therefore, if anyone says that the blessed Peter, the apostle, was not appointed by Christ the Lord as prince of all apostles and visible head of the whole church militant, or that was a primacy of honor only, let him be an anathema. And we close. For no one can be in doubt, indeed it was known in every age, that the holy and most blessed Peter, prince and head of the apostles, the pillar of faith and the foundation of the Catholic Church, received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the human race, and that to this day and forevermore he lives and presides and exercises judgment in his successors, the bishops of the Holy Roman See, which he founded and consecrated with his blood. Therefore, this is the last therefore, if anyone <laughs> says that it is not by institution of the Christ the Lord himself that blessed Peter should have perpetual successors, in the primacy over the whole church, or that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter in his primacy, let him be an anathema. So, what does this mean, is what you're asking. I'll summarize. Four points. Peter was given, number one, a position of absolute primacy over the rest of the apostles, in which he functioned as vicar of Christ, head of church universal, supreme pastor over the whole fold, a.k.a. Pope. Two, Peter's papal office is one that is transferable. Therefore, it's not just to him alone, but rather it was passed on in a continuous and perpetual line of successors. Point number three. These doctrines have always been understood in this way, known in every age of the church, and they represent the ancient and unchanging faith of the entire church universal. Number four. These doctrines are absolutely binding and must be believed. There's no room to say that maybe they're just the most probable, or maybe just the most likely of interpretations or conclusions. They must be believed, and to hold any other belief, qualifies one as an anathema. Now I will evaluate the two passages which Vatican I has dogmatically and infallibly defined to defend their position on the legitimacy of the papacy. The first will be Matthew chapter 16, verse Matthew 16, 15 to 20. I'll read it again, you're hearing. It says, what about you? 
Jesus asked, asked Luke 12, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he is the Christ. Rome claims that Peter is the rock of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and that in this passage, Christ is instituting the office of Pope upon Peter. We must ask, is this passage focused upon, one, the foundation of the papacy, or two, the identity of Jesus Christ? I assert to you that the central theme of this passage is the messiahship of Jesus Christ. I'll go through a quick overview of the passage. In verse 16, Jesus, upon asking the question, has Peter, and Peter gives the right answer. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Correct. Jesus says that he is blessed, not because of some superior intellect or character, but rather because he says this revelation is from God, the Father. Then, in verse 18, he turns his direction to Peter. And he says, blessed are you, as I mentioned, and I tell you that you are Peter, you are Petros, and on this rock, on this Petra, I will build my church. And then he goes on to give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He does not say, obviously, upon you, Peter, nor does he say, upon this rock and your successors. Jesus says, upon this rock. Upon this, the Greek being hutos, a demonstrative pronoun, which diverts the attention away from Peter and opens up the rock to be either the proclamation of Jesus Christ or Christ himself. In verse 19, then he promises to at some point in the future give Peter the keys to the kingdom. Notice that his will, therefore the future tense, nothing of authority is actually given in this passage. In verse 20, it concludes, again focusing on the identity of Jesus Christ, as Jesus says, do not tell anyone that I am the Christ. Now, I will absolutely grant that there is a clear and undeniable wordplay that exists. You are Peter, and on this rock. You are Petros in the Greek, and on this Petra in the Greek, I will build my church. However, this wordplay does not necessarily mean that Peter himself is the rock. It is just as likely that Peter, excuse me, that Jesus wanted to use a powerful play on words in order to make the situation itself more memorable, or to show that Peter himself was the one who gave the confession that Jesus was the rock. As scholar Edward Denny says, the reason why the name Peter was given to Simon Bar Jonah is because he is the worthy confessor of the true rock, which is Christ. Now, an important note must be made. Even if it can be proven, without the shadow of a doubt, that Peter is the rock of Matthew 16 18, it does not lead to popery. It is an unwarranted leap to say that Peter being an apostle of initial prominence leads to him being vicar of Christ, head of church universal, supreme pastor over the whole fold, aka pope, as Rome claims it does. I will now assert to you multiple reasons why I believe that the rock of Matthew 16 19 is either, one, the confession that Peter gave, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, or two, Christ himself. Both of these playing and working hand in hand. First, consider the context of the passage. It starts and it ends, verse 20, with the identity of Christ. To act as if Jesus himself gives some special regard to exalting Peter is to introduce an odd shift in the flow of thought that does not fit within the context of the passage. Number two, nothing of authority is actually given in this passage. Again, Jesus is speaking to Peter, yes, but he says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The verb is future tense. The actual giving of these keys occurs just two chapters later, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, when Jesus himself says to all of the twelve disciples, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will have been loose in heaven. Whatever authority is promised here in Matthew 16, in the keys and the binding and the loosing, is then given to the entirety of the twelve just two chapters later, not just to Peter. Therefore, this authority of the keys and the binding and the loosing cannot be viewed as the authority to establish a papal office. Reason number three, other gospel accounts do record this event. It occurs in Matthew chapter 8, it occurs in Luke chapter 9. However, both of them leave out the portion in which Jesus himself says to Peter, you are Peter, etc. Most scholars would agree that Mark was the first of the Gospels written. Mark was a disciple of Peter, and most people would say, in fact, that a lot of the material that ended up in Mark actually came from Peter himself. To hold to the Catholic position, one must believe that Mark and Peter both, in the first Gospel, being written in the early church, failed to mention the event which 
gave Peter primacy in the office of Vicar of Christ, head of Church Universal. That which is a bedrock truth, a foundational and pivotal truth for the whole church. One would find it quite shocking to believe that they would leave it exempt. Four, the rest of Scripture. There are many indications in the Scriptures that Peter did not view himself as having higher authority than the other apostles, nor did the other apostles view Peter as having higher authority than they themselves had. I will give more on this later. Fifth, there is scholarly attestation to this. This is not an interpretation that is exempt from scholarly backing. Such scholars who take this stance of the rock being either Christ or the confession Peter gave are John MacArthur, James White, Kent Mathis, R.G.G. Tasker, and John Piper. To quote John MacArthur, <coughs> the foundation of the church is the revelation of God given through his apostles, and the Lord of the church is the cornerstone of that foundation because it is his word that the apostles taught and that the faithful church has always taught. Jesus Christ himself is the true foundation. To personally resound and reiterate what MacArthur just said, I would gladly have the church that is built upon a sinless Christ over and above a sinful Peter. Six, church father, early church father attestation. It is not at all the case nor has it ever been, that the consensus of early church fathers believed that Peter was the rock. In his quite extensive work titled Papalism, Edward Denny surveys the interpretations of this passage from the early church fathers. In fact, his conclusions are actually supported by French Roman Catholic theologian Lenoir. He surveyed all the early church fathers and determined that there are four main understandings or interpretations of what the rock of Matthew chapter 16, verse 19 is. One is that the rock is the twelve apostles. Two is that the rock is Christ himself. Three, that the rock is Peter. Or four, that the rock is the faith upon which Peter confessed. Here are the results he found. Eight church fathers believed it to be the twelve apostles. Sixteen church fathers believed the rock to be Christ himself. Seventeen church fathers believed the rock to be Peter. And forty-four church fathers believed it to be the faith upon which Peter confessed. A sampling of some of those who believe the rock to be the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, include these names. John Chrysostom, Augustine, Pope Leo, Pope Felix, Pope Gregory the Great, Pope Adrian, Pope John Seth, Gregory of Nyssa, Cyril of Alexandria, and Gregory the Great. That is 80% of interpretations that differ from the infallibly defined Roman Catholic dogma, which says Peter himself is the Pope. Again, remember, though, that simply asserting that Peter is the rock does not lead to the conclusion of the institution of the papal office with subsequent successors. So, how many then said that the rock was an office that was then transferable? <coughs> the answer to that, according to Edward Denny in French Roman Catholic Illinois, is zero. Again, I remind you of the words read earlier from the infallible decrees of Vatican I, but this is the ancient and unchanging faith that has always been understood in every age. Clearly, this is not the case. The next text which we'll deal with is John chapter 21, verse 15 to 17. As Swan talked about it, I'll quickly read it in your hearing. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Again, I'll remind you of what he said in the text of Vatican I. It says, and it was to Peter alone that Jesus, after his resurrection, confided the jurisdiction of supreme pastor and ruler of his whole fold, saying, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. In other words, from this text, Rome collects the interpretation that Peter is the chief pastor over all Christians. I do not believe this to be an exegetically sound nor an academically honest interpretation of this text. So what is Jesus saying here? Clearly, from beginning to end, the passage is first and foremost restorative in nature. Jesus is not instating Peter as the only one of the apostles to feed and shepherd the flock. To remind you of a quick, a little bit of context, a few chapters earlier, in John chapter 13, we know Peter when he said, Lord, I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, eh, will you really lay down my life for you? Right? Very truly, I tell you that before the roasts are crows, you will disown me three times. And we know that Peter did exactly that. After nine in the first, third time, it says that he went outside and that he wept bitterly. This is the first interaction that Peter and Jesus have one-on-one -on -one since this time. Peter was in need of a special pastoral care in this moment, and Jesus gives him just that. 
Nothing in this passage would suggest to us that the other apostles were not also commanded to feed and shepherd the flock. In fact, there are two other texts that use the exact same word that Jesus used while talking to Peter when he says, take care of my sheep. The Greek word being poimeneo. I point you to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Paul is exhorting the Ephesian elders, multiplicity of them, of course, and he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit made you overseers to shepherd, poimeneo, the church of God. Paul gives the same exhortation to the Ephesian elders that Jesus did to Peter in John 15. Or 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. Peter is exhorting all the elders of the local churches to which he is addressing in his letters. And he says, shepherd, poimeneo, the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. Peter himself gave the same word exhortation that he received from Christ to all the elders of whom he writes. Therefore, this command that Jesus gives to Peter to tend, shepherd, and feed the flock is not for Peter alone, but for all who have the office of formal leadership within the local church. D.A. Carson says this, Nothing in the present passage suggests a distinctive authority for Peter. These verses deal with his reinstatement to service, not in any way with his elevation to privacy. Clearly, this text does not set Peter apart, but shows that he was in need of special pastoral care on behalf of Christ, with Jesus displaying to Peter that he is not disqualified for leadership based on his quite recent blunder of denying Jesus three times, but that Jesus, as he still is, commanded, as to all the faithful of Christ's church, to shepherd the flock. I will now show you a few passages in which I believe point to the fact that Peter did not view himself as having higher authority than the rest of the apostles, nor did the other apostles view Peter as having higher authority than they themselves had. Luke chapter 22, verse 24. This is the night of the Last Supper, right before Jesus' crucifixion. A dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Surely this is something that would appear quite odd if they truly believed Jesus himself had given Peter a place of primacy with status and position above that of, his re of the rest. Surely Jesus would have rebuked them right there and said, well, I've already told you that Peter himself is the greatest. We obviously do not see that happen. In other texts, at this point, Jesus gives an exhortation to serve leadership. The Jerusalem Council, documented in Acts chapter 15, the largest council that happens in the entire first century. The big decision needs to be made. Can Gentiles be allowed into the church, or do they need to be circumcised first? What is Peter's role in this council? He is clearly a participant, not in any way functioning with the capacity of a pope. In verse 2, it said those who went to the council went to see the apostles and the elders. In verse 6, it said those who met were the apostles and the elders. Paul and Peter both give up, and they do talk about their experiences in ministering to Gentiles during this council. However, it is in verse 19 that James himself stands up and says, it is my judgment. And he gives the final declaration of what the council as a whole decides. Surely it would be quite odd that Peter, the vicar of Christ, the one who can speak ex cathedra, infallibly, on behalf of Christ, is not given a larger role in making this extremely important decision in the early first century church. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes in verse 9 that James, Peter, and John are those reputed to be pillars. There are three who are pillars of the church, not just one, according to Paul. Going on, as Peter comes up to Antioch, he begins to specifically separate away from the Gentiles and specifically eat and associate with the Jews. In verse 11, Paul said that Peter was clearly in the wrong, so much so that he opposed him to his face. Paul calls Peter's actions hypocrisy in verse 12, and then when others follow Peter's lead, Paul says that they were led astray. Can you imagine that someone following the lead of the Pope would be considered led astray? And then it says that Paul says to Peter, they were not straightforward with the truth of the gospel. To Paul, the very essence of the gospel was being compromised, and that apparently by the one who was vicar of Christ. To Paul, this was not some sort of infraction of immoral living that was quite minor, but rather it was a doctrinal error, and it was a very grave and serious one of that, one in which Paul's interaction with Peter seems in no way to indicate that Paul viewed Peter as having greater authority than he himself possessed. Peter addresses the elders local church of which he writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. He says, To the elders among you, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. Notice Peter calls himself a fellow elder, a fellow presbyteros, not the vicar of Christ, using the same title to refer to himself as that of the elders for all the local churches to which he is addressing. To conclude, Rome makes dogmatic claims about the institution of the papacy and the succession of the papal office. Rome claims 
that these doctrines must necessarily be held to belong to the church and that they represent the ancient and unchanging faith of the whole church. I have demonstrated to you tonight that the two passages that Rome has infallibly defined to defend these doctrines do not in fact do so and rely upon importing a large amount of already held beliefs into the text. Nor are there early church fathers on the side of the Roman Catholic Church in regards to their interpretation of these texts. Rather, a large majority of early church fathers held a view of Matthew 16, 18, and 19 specifically that is untenable with the view held by the Roman Catholic Church. Sadly, I don't have time to go into the early church father understanding of John 21. Additionally, through just a few of what could be many more passages, I demonstrate that Peter himself did not view himself as having higher authority than the rest of the apostles, nor did the other apostles view Peter as having higher authority than they themselves had. Again, I remind you of a quote that I shared with you two weeks ago from Catholic writer John O'Brien. He said, Reason and experience compel us to say that the Bible alone is not a competent or a safe guide as to what we are to believe. Based on what I have presented to you tonight, I believe it would be a safe bet to say that the papacy is not a safe or competent guide as to what we are to believe. I ended at 20 on the dot, too. I don't know how I did that. Thanks. All right, if you recall, I argued tonight that Christ established a successional Petrine ministry that is supreme and infallible. I based this on Matthew 16, 18 to 19, and John 21, 15 to 17, and I also cited some Protestant scholars on their exegesis of the scriptures, and even the acknowledgement that at least among the earliest fathers, there was a consensus that Peter had successors. Now, the extent of that authority has been debated throughout history, but as I'll try to show tonight from church fathers and the scriptures themselves, we shouldn't take the disagreement among the fathers so seriously. And also, if Ty's going to cite the church fathers, then when is he going to believe the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? They were unanimous on that from the beginning. Now, when it comes to uh, the arguments that he made against Matthew 16, 18, and 19, Ty tried to deny that Peter is the rock. And I noticed that he didn't mention much about verse 19, which is quite important for the argument itself. I bracketed Peter being the rock under the comparison to Eliakim. So what he says in response then is that he basically proposes that instead of the rock being Peter himself, then it has to be instead Christ. Well, I have four reasons against that interpretation. First, um, regarding the word Petros and Petra. Craig Skinner points out that by Jesus' day, the Greek term Petros, which stands for Peter, and Petra, rock, were interchangeable. Moreover, according to Vincent R. Mar or Martin R. Vincent in his word studies in the New Testament in 1946, quote, the word neither refers to Christ as a rock, distinguishing from Simon of Stone, not to Peter's confession, but to Peter himself. The reference of Petra to Christ is forced and unnatural. The obvious reference to the word is Peter. This, the emphatic is naturally refers to the nearest antecedent, and besides, the metaphor is thus weakened, since Christ appears here not as the foundation, but as the architect. Second, David Bivens' article in the language environment of first century Judea examines the fact that if you look at the language that Christ used in the original passage, regardless of if it's Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic, you would not dismiss or you would not miss the fact that Peter and the rock are once and the same. For instance, if Christ said the declaration in Aramaic, it would say, thou art kepha, and upon this kepha I will build my church. The pun would not be able to be dismissed. Leander E. Keck, a professor of New Testament studies at Yale and the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary notes, that for us English readers, that passage should actually sound like this, thou art rock, and upon this rock I build my church. So notice here that when Ty tried to propose that this is an in, you know, uh, Rome reading into the passage, these are the vast majority of Protestant New Testament scholars today. Recall once again the three sources that I cited previously summarizing what the consensus of scholars are. Now, when it comes to Christ saying upon this rock, he uses the Greek word taute. Now, taute means in Strong's Greek 3778, this denoting the same object that was previously referred to. Consider Matthew 1, 19 to 20, where Joseph plans on quietly divorcing Mary, in verse 19, due to what appears to be an unlawful pregnancy. Matthew 1, 20 begins with, but as he considered these things, Tauta, and then closes with the angel reassuring him of God's plan. 
Tauta here establishes that what Joseph is thinking about in verse 20 is the same as what was uttered, his plan to divorce Mary, among other concerns. So then, even the Greek there with the word this denotes sameness, not a distinction or difference. Moreover, D.A. Carson, in his commentary on Matthew, notes that if the Protestant interpretation were correct, we would not expect Petros and Petra. We would expect Petros and Lithos. D.A. Carson writes, Had Matthew wanted to say no more than that Peter was a stone in contrast to Jesus the rock, the more common word would have been Lithos, a stone of almost any size. Then there would not have been a pun, and that is just the point. Finally, I mentioned in my opening speech the Jewish sources that convinced the vast majority, regardless of their Protestant or Catholic New Testament scholars, that Peter is the rock. For instance, the Yalkut Shimoni is a parable that describes how at the beginning of the world, when God created it, he chose Peter, uh, excuse me, Abraham as the secure foundation on which he would build the world. And then even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Thanksgiving hymn, it describes how the Jews believed that communities were built on rocks. So if you were a first century Jew listening to what Peter, uh, excuse me, Jesus was saying, then you would not miss the point that was made. Moreover, uh, we, we also acknowledge, for instance, in Christer Stendhal's work in the Peak's commentary on the Bible, he notes, quote, different attempts to interpret the rock as something else than Peter in person are in most cases shown to be expressions of Protestant bias. So even Protestant scholars are calling upon other Protestants to finally understand that the Greek, the original understanding and interpretation of the passage is indisputable. Peter is the rock upon which Christ built the church. So my question to Ty would be tonight, how is your church built on the person of Peter? I didn't cite church fathers. I didn't cite Catholic scholars. I cited the top Protestant New Testament scholars and authorities in the field. Now, when it comes to then um, why Peter doesn't mention the fact that uh, in, in Mark's gospel that he had received the keys to the kingdom, we actually have an explanation from the church historian Eusebius. Eusebius comments, quote, Mark being his friend and companion is said to have recorded the accounts of Peter about the acts of Jesus. And when he comes to the part of the story where Jesus asked who men said that he was and what opinion his disciples had of him, and Peter replied that they regarded him as the Christ, he writes that Jesus answered nothing and said not to him, except that he charged him to say nothing about him. For Mark was not present when Jesus spoke those words, and Peter did not think it right to bring forward on his own testimony what was said to him and concerning him by Jesus. So the reason why Peter doesn't tell John Mark in Mark's gospel why he received the keys of the kingdom is because he was hesitant to share that information with others. And obviously that's true because in the next passage, Peter makes a huge blunder. Likewise, if you're going to brag about John 21, 15 to 17 and say you're the head shepherd, you have to acknowledge, well, the reason why you were having to be reinstated to service is because you messed up. So notice that each time Peter is elevated in Scripture, there's also the fact that he messed up. But the point is that Jesus still believes in him, just as Jesus still believes in us even when we mess up in our lives. Now, I want to point out some other things that Ty tried to say tonight. So, for instance, on his arguments with John 21, 15 to 17, I noticed that he didn't engage any of the arguments that I presented in my opening statement, and neither did he engage the ancient Jewish sources upon this particular passage. Now, when he tries to argue that there aren't examples of Petrine primacy, or that the apostles didn't view Peter as anything higher, let me just provide some, uh, some examples. So, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, the resurrected Christ appears to Peter first. In Luke 24, 33 to 35, the Emmaus disciples tell the apostles that Jesus appeared to Peter, even though in their encounter, Jesus doesn't mention the fact that he had shown himself to Peter. The angels on the morning of Christ's resurrection pressed the women to pass the good news to Christ's disciples and Peter, singling him out once again, Mark 16, 7. Even though John beats Peter to the tomb, John waits until Peter enters and then follows, John 24 to 6. Peter speaks on behalf of all the apostles on multiple occasions, Matthew 16, 16, Matthew 17, 1 to 8, Matthew 18, 21, Matthew 19, 27, Mark 10, 28, Mark 11, 20, 21, and I can go on and on and on. Now, uh, and in, even in the passage in Luke 22, 31 to 32, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to, see, to sift each of you, himos, like wheat. But I have prayed for you, sow, in the singular, that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Notice that Jesus entrusts the other apostles into Jesus' care. I mean, into Peter's care. And even though Satan is going after all the apostles, Jesus doesn't pray, protect all the apostles. Jesus prays, Peter, your responsibility is to take care of your brothers. Now, uh, Ty also tried to cite various other examples, such as, for instance, 22, 24, and then he cites verse 25 to 30. 
Now, in the next few verses, if you look at verse 25 to 30, Jesus doesn't deny that there is a greater apostle. And even Matthew 10, 2 talks about how Peter is first, or protos. What Jesus says is that if you want to be first, then you have to be last. If you're going to be great, then you have to become a servant of all. And if, if, if the Pope is the universal pastor of all Christians, then he's also at the service of all Christians. Now, when it comes to Acts chapter 15, there is a fact that Peter does commit, or allow, rather, James to make the final decision. And that's because in B.H. Streeter's book, uh, the, 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 what is it, B.H. Uh, Streeter's book on the early church, B.H. Streeter mentions the fact that James is the bishop of Jerusalem at the time. And therefore, you know, Peter doesn't have to go Rambo on doctrine and define everything in the beginning. There's the witness of the early apostles, and he can allow them to make those decisions. But also, there was no mentioning of the fact that Acts 5 seems to be an appearance of Peter having the throne of Moses. Now, I could go on, but I don't, I'm running out of time. When it comes to Galatians 2, I just want to point out that Paul is calling out Peter's character, and he's not calling out his doctrine. So even though he's not acting in accordance with the gospel, that's because he's not acting consistently in the Christian faith. But Peter is not definitively divining any doctrine or stating uh, such. Now, for instance, uh, Paul continues to respect Peter, Craig S. Keener, in his commentary on Galatians notes, far from displaying any direct conflict with these apostles, However, Paul seems to at pains to emphasize their support of his non-circumcision policy. It is very clear that Peter makes that he makes an, uh, that he is upset with Peter for being so hypocritical. Paul does confront and publicly embarrass Peter, but in verse ten, ten, well, uh, chapter two, verse one to ten, merely prepares to recount that confrontation. Paul is silent about any enduring schism and continues to recognize that God uses Peter's ministry. So once again, I don't think we've heard any successful arguments tonight against the positions that I've offered. Thanks, Juan. I would agree it's a tall task to respond to everything in 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll do what I can, as I know that he did as well. Um, so first off, uh, Swan started. I'll respond to a few things from his opening statement. Uh, Swan made the assertion to begin that uh, Peter is the new Eliakim, referring to the typological parallel that exists to Isaiah chapter 20, verse 2, verse 22, and to Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. I'll bring up just a few issues that exist with Swan's interpretation of this passage. First off, in Isaiah 22, verse 22, it says that there is one key, singular, which Eliakim receives, not multiple keys, plural, that Peter receives in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Most importantly, Jesus himself has a different understanding and interpretation of this text, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, than that of what has been put forth by Swan. Starting with the simple acknowledgement, which I think we all would, that Jesus is a better interpreter of scripture than we are, this leads us to a different conclusion. Jesus says that Isaiah 22 and the key being given to Eliakim was fulfilled in himself, not in Peter, or the bishop of Rome. The interpretation given by Jesus himself, when he specifically cites word for word, Isaiah 22, 22, refers to himself, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus says this, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words to him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Present tense, Jesus has this key to David. Swan says that it was given to Peter. Sometime probably around 30 AD. We know that Peter died, therefore it should have been given maybe to his successors who filled in his place at the Bishop of Rome. Yet Jesus says in 90 AD that he, present tense, has the keys. And then he says, what I open, no one will shut, and what I shut, no one will open, using the exact same terminology that Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22 does. Additionally, there is not a single church father, now I challenge one to show this to me, who used this passage as a support of the concept of the papacy, or asserted that there's any relevance at all, or an illusion, from Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, to Isaiah 22. Again, there's no patristic evidence for this source. Uh, to continue on, he quotes uh, D.A. Carson, um, specifically in D.A. Carson's understanding of Matthew chapter 23, Verse 1 to 3, referring to the seat of Moses. Um, I have a lot here, so I'm going to go ahead. And um, he said that D.A. Carson says there is uh, 
there is a consensus among scholars as to what the nature of the throne of Moses is. This is, this is just not the case, okay? Noel Rabinowitz writes an article, Does Jesus recognize the authority of the Pharisees, and does he endorse our halakha? This was a journal that was published in the Evangelical uh, Theological Society. And, and here's what he says. He says there have been no less than four interpretations of the seat of Moses that have been proposed. The first is that the seat was an actual piece of synagogue furniture upon which authorized interpreters in the Torah sat. G.C. Newport, Donald Hagner, Noel Rabinowitz. The expression, interpretation number two, is a metaphor referring to the fact that Pharisees had assumed the role of being law's interpreters. This is held by Craig Keener. So Craig Keener actually says, no, it actually means that they had usurped, or they had assumed the role of Moses, or the authority of Moses, which they didn't have. Interpretation number three, the seat of Moses was a specially designed chair upon which the Torah scroll sat during the synagogue service. Interpretation number four, the expression refers to the social position of the Pharisees as those who control access to the Torah. There is not at all scholarly, scholarly consensus as to what exactly the chair or the seat of Moses is. In fact, there's lots of evidence to show that it is a literal chair that Moses himself sat in. Okay? In fact, there's actually rabbinic work that confirms this. Pesik Rab Kah confirms this. There's actually archaeological evidence confirming this as well. There are seats such as found in uh, synagogues in Chorazin and Gedi, Hamat, um, Delphos, and other places as well. D.A. Carson ends the quote that uh, Swan started by saying, in what follows, Jesus will dispute their authority to that authoritative rule. So that it is probably right to read this verse like the exhortation which follows in verse 3, as ironical. D.A. Carson says that it is satirical. That it is ironical language, which Matthew is using in Matthew chapter 23, that says it seems as if they take the seat of Moses. Okay. Next, he discusses uh, John chapter 21, verse 15 to 17. Um, in his opening statement, he tried to make this large distinction that existed uh, between these three different types of sheep, right? And he's saying that uh, Jesus starts with the smaller sheep, and then he goes to the medium sheep, and the big sheep. And that this is paralleling what Moses did earlier in giving authority to Joshua. Okay? I will go ahead and quote to you uh, one of the greatest Catholic theologians of the last 100 years, Raymond Brown. He says this in his commentary on John. But the fact that there are possibly three words for sheep in verse 15 to 17, as Swan said, is no more significant than the fact that there are three different words for fish in verse 5 to 13. Nor is there much plausibility at all in the thesis that the diminutive should be taken literally, and thus there is a progression in the size of sheep, with the symbolic import that the flock includes the younger as well as that of the mature. The difficulty of evaluating the diminutives of New Testament Greek is notorious. Whatever diminutive force there is, is scarcely at all significant. That is Raymond Brown, a Roman Catholic theologian. Okay, um, to continue on, uh, he talks about four reasons that the rock can't be Christ. He talks about all these distinct distinctions that exist between the word Petros and between the word Petra. Again, notice, in the six reasons I gave that the rock was Christ or the confession, I didn't at all talk about any sort of Petra or Petros distinction, so he wasn't responding to anything I said. And again, what I did say was that there is a word play that exists, it is undeniable, but the fact that it refers to Peter being the rock doesn't necessarily follow. It could also mean that Peter himself is the confessor of the rock, as different scholars such as Edward Denny says, or that Jesus was just trying to make the situation more memorable. He then quotes a bunch of individuals, um, scholars, who say, well, it's so clear, it's so obvious from the Greek that, uh, that Peter would have been, uh, or that, that from the language that Jesus was clearly uh, saying that Peter himself was the rock. Well, if that is the case, then I ask Swan, if it is so obvious in the Greek, how is it that all of the Greek-speaking church fathers missed it? Notice he did not at all deal with the fact that the early church fathers, as almost a unanimous whole, did not agree that Peter himself was the rock. 80% disagreed with that. And again, I remind you of the words of Vatican I, which says it's the ancient, unchanging faith of the whole church, which he himself did not in any way try to combat. Uh, Next he said, Ty, how is your church built upon Peter? I would respond by saying that in Acts chapter 2, we see that Peter himself is the first one to share the gospel in a way to where the Holy Spirit falls, the kingdom of God is now open, and Jesus himself and his kingdom has come. That is how Peter has built the church. Also in Galatians 2, Paul himself says that Peter would go to the circumcised, but that Paul himself would go to the Gentiles. 
uh, he talks about uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 30, and uh, tries to use this as a text in order to support Petrine primacy. I'll go ahead and read this text to you. Luke chapter 22, verse 30, reads as such. Uh, there it is. Uh, verse 31, excuse me. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you of wheat as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Petrine primacy from that text. I believe that that is a very, very far reach. And Satan desires, yes, to sift all the disciples, as he desires to sift all Christians. But Jesus warns Peter that he, more than anyone else, stands in danger. Evidently, Peter's quick tongue and rash impetuosity placed him in a greater position of danger. And so Jesus said, I'm praying for you, specifically Peter. Doesn't that make sense? We know that in the very next passage, Jesus himself denies Peter three times. So it makes sense that Jesus is praying only for Peter. That doesn't mean somehow that Peter has some sort of primacy, that he should be considered head of church universal, that he could, should be considered vicar of Christ. That is definitely unwarranted. Also, the command that he gives to Peter, which is, and strengthen your brother, is a command that, again, is given to all people not just Peter. That's nothing that's abnormal. It's the Greek word sterizo, strengthen. It is also used in Romans chapter 1, in which Paul says that he went to strengthen the Romans. And it is also used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, in which he exhorts Timothy to go and to strengthen those who are in Thessalonica. And that's all I've got. <laughs> I think I responded to anything I wanted to when I was a few seconds short. So. Sorry. Okay, that's good. I'm going to have, uh, we're going to move the furniture just a touch. What we're going to do is we're going to just have a discussion at this time, uh, the three of us. And uh, I think this is going to bear some fruit. We'll probably go, what, what time do we got right now? I know at 8.30, so it's 8.07, at 8.30 we're going to kill the live stream. Uh, and so our Facebook Live, we'll go 20 minutes, we'll let you kill the live stream. That's really, bid. that's really going to hurt my mom's feelings. She left it. <laughs> Thanks for watching at home, Mom. Thank you for showing up. to watch. But then we will uh, maybe go into just a, a few closing statements after that, if that sounds right. What I'm going to do is I'm just, you guys feel good about me just pulling up a, a chair and you guys then move the podium to the side and we just go from there. Mm -hmm. We uh, This church was built in 1963. And we're pretty sure that the furniture that they uh, used in 1963 is already 10 or 15 years old. So. Yeah. Great. So, so very important here. <laughs> I should have worn a longer socks. I look like a fool. I don't know. I got a computer back. Maybe. Oh, you want me to? I think so. Just so you guys can see it. All right. Um, so as I was thinking this, here's, here's probably what I was thinking as I was paying attention. Um, well, we all have Google, right? And so it'd be very easy for me to simply Google arguments against Catholic teaching on, on papal infallibility, and then to Google arguments for papal infallibility. And you can find a lot of this Petrus, Petros stuff, uh, in, in any of that. Uh, these guys are brilliant, no doubt. I mean, let's, uh, how about a round of applause for this group? <laughs> Father Drew and I were talking last week, we were just saying that it was fun. It was fun to just listen to two guys that are a lot smarter than we are uh, going at it, talking theology. So, you know, it's when you go to seminary, you get a lot of that. You get a lot of really smart dudes talking about theology. So that's kind of what, what I was feeling like. But my question is, is obviously you're, you're both very well informed on your side's uh, teaching. Is there hope? <laughs> is there hope that we would ever come together uh, and, and believe maybe some of the same stuff? It's easy. It's easy to put forth a hypothesis and then formulate arguments toward your hypothesis if that's primarily 
what you're, you're looking for. I mean, that's, that's absolutely what I would do, right? I'm a, I'm a Catholic priest. I'm going to look for our side's argument. And so th that'd be my first question. Is there hope? Um, second question, maybe it's just where did you see your opponent actually do, do a good job? <laughs> Where did where did what, what did you think that maybe Ty you know Ty what did you think the Swan did well what Swan what did you think that Ty did well, um, and then maybe for the follow up there is I just have some questions maybe are we missing each other in regards to what we think about when we think about papal infallibility collegiality of the bishops the magisterium and primacy of Peter um, is that sound fair to just me kind of step back now listen to the two of you chat about those three things. And in the midst of that, I would, I would also encourage you to take it where it goes. One of the things that I really love is just listening to, to Ty and Swan talk. Uh, again, I'm just inspired by their, their brilliance. So take it from there. Is there hope? Uh, um, what was my second question? What did the other do well? And then what are we really talking about here with infallibility, with collegiality, primacy of Peter? Okay, do you want to go first, Ty? Or? I'll go on, Steve, if that's all right. It doesn't matter. Okay. Like rock, paper, scissors game? Or? Uh, well, I mean, Peter's the rock, so. Whatever it is, man. Can I, can I start off by just saying what I think Ty did really well tonight? So I think Ty, like, um, I mean, you, uh, you, you came prepared. And, uh, you know, with my opening statement, I was like, dang, I'm running out of time. I can't talk about my arguments, you know? And I was like, wow, he really put up a fight. Um, and I think the, yeah, I think about Acts 15, and I, I stumbled on the source, but it was B.H. Schreeder's book, The Primitive Church, where he talks about how James was the, the bishop of Jerusalem. And uh, I think, I mean, there, you know, Peter, I didn't get to talk about Acts 15, but there is, I think, places in which I think I see Peter having a primacy of authority, although he allows James to make the final ruling. But yeah, that's, I think that's a pretty good case to look at. I didn't get to talk about like Galatians or the others, but you know, I thought it was really good that you came prepared and you came in guns blazing and I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to give you the time to get to the other ones too, but uh, you can see. so there was what our opponent did well, and what was the second one? Hope for unity. Ho oh, okay. Right, I think. Yeah, Hope for unity. Okay, well, or do you just want to go back and forth on these? Or you can, you can go ahead. You can go through all of them. Well, yeah, I'll just do this one and I want to let you talk. Um, when it comes to hope for unity, I think that the arguments that I presented tonight, they predominantly came from Protestant scholars, and especially top Protestant scholars in their field. And we've seen over the years that there's been a consensus, at least since the late 70s, of Peter being the rock. Uh, we've seen cons uh, a growing consensus that 16, Isaiah, uh, Matthew 16, 19, Isaiah 22, 22 are typological parallels. We've had the work of Marcus Bachmo recognizing that there were Petrine successors. We've had the work of Roger David Oss acknowledging that Peter was made head shepherd. I think that these trends in scholarship show us that there is the possibility of unity, even if we differ on the exact details. Gotcha. Hey, thanks. Um, sorry, I was trying to type up a few things at the same time. I commend my opponent, Swan, as well. Thanks for just giving a, a solid opening statement, um, the way in which you're able to um, quote a lot of a lot of different scholars, a lot of different commentators, and a lot of first century rabbinic sources, I, I think is really outstanding, extremely impressive, as I, I've told you a few times uh, before. And I think that uh, your, uh, your use of Protestant scholars is quite voluminous. I mean, you, you have a lot of Protestant scholars who back up you know, some, of the, some of the claims that you would make. Um, I think maybe somewhat of a conundrum there that exists is that, and you know this of course, mm -hmm. right? But that uh, and a lot of those things you're bringing up, you're bringing up an amount of scholars that does agree to something, but that doesn't necessarily include the majority of the consensus. Now, on some of these issues that brought up, it might, right? Like Ed Grant gave Matthew chapter, 16, um, 18, 19, most Protestant commentators would agree that Peter is the rock. However, there is still a viable amount of scholars that do say, no, the, the, the rock is Christ, and it's the confession of Jesus is the Christ, right? And so for me, my, actually, my decision to go with the rock being Christ or the confession isn't really based on the, the Petra, Petrus, Petrus distinction. 
Um, like I said, it was kind of a few other reasons that I gave. I think context is a huge one, as I think that especially the way it ends in verse 20, with saying that, you know, Jesus said, don't tell them about the fact that I'm the Messiah. It seems that we're beginning to end. Christ's identity is the key. So what I'm saying is, you're you're bringing a lot of Protestant scholars to the table and saying they agree with me that Peter's the rock, which is true. But there's also a large amount that don't, and it's like that on every issue, you know. Um, and the other thing then is just because they agree with you on the rock doesn't obviously, as you know, lead to the conclusions that you yourself have and come to about what that actually means in terms of institution of the papacy and then the institution of a transferable office as well. So I'm uh, kind of getting off, but. Um, I don't know where we were going with yeah, this. Any, so any hopes? Any hope. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if we were going. Um, any hope? There's lots of hope for some things, right? We'd all agree that as Paul said, there's hope for the resurrection. So yeah. we're all hoping for the resurrection bodies that uh, will get there much more fit than the ones we have now. In terms of hope for unity, I know that's what you're talking about. Um, Christ prays for it in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Hopefully it's something that happens. This idea of unity is something that I know we talked about a little bit last time. I think it's an interesting sort of idea, like, let me talk about this. I'm looking at saying, like, what does unity mean, right? Um, does that mean exact, complete, 100% theological unanimity, meaning that we believe every single thing, the exact same about the guy to the right and left of us in the view, right? I don't think that's what Jesus prayed for when he prayed for unity. I don't think that's what Paul exhorted when he exhorted toward unity. Right? I've met people in churches and they're like, all of us believe the exact same thing about every every single day. It's like. There's no way. There's no way. Um, so I think unity that you're talking about, Father Gale, is more of like, um, can we agree on a core amount or a core essential group of ideas and then move forward together, right? And um, I think that that's an interesting thought because obviously the position that Swan holds and the position that I hold right, are mutually exclusive, right? Like, like you can't hold one with the other, right? Um, and I mean, I'm just being real, like according to Vatican I, my position leads me to be anathematized or excommunicated, right? I mean, that's just reading Vatican I. But that doesn't mean that, like, that it's not things that each of us can do that we think furthers the kingdom of God nonetheless. So, like, for example, I deeply admire the Catholic Church and their ability to stand up specifically over the issue of abortion. Like, they do it better than anyone else. And, like, props to different people in the Catholic Church who um, are really for. Um, the pro-life movement. So I think there, there's hope for unity in the sense where there's things that we can look at that the Catholic Church does. There's things that the Catholic Church can look at as the wide swath of Protestants and say, like, hey, they're doing some good things. So they, they're doing some good things, right? But I think there are still key doctrines that, that keep us doctrinally separated that essentially someone's going to actually have to make a decision to choose, hey, which one's more scriptural, which one is more legitimate, am I going to choose the Catholic position on say, some source of authority or justification, et cetera, or the Protestant position. So that's kind of maybe how I dissect that question. Good. I don't know what thoughts you have. That's great. Uh, actually, because I want to hear you guys talk also about what you want to talk about after you've done talking about what I want you to talk about. <laughs> uh, I would love to just talk uh, at this time about uh, how we see the primacy of the Pope or as Peter, right? Even uh, speaking infallibly, there's, there's much that goes with the Pope speaking infallibly, um, that he's also in union with the magisterium of the church when he makes a statement and a census uh, fidelium, meaning the, the, the faith of the people. And so those three things go together, and then the Pope sets uh, a chair of Peter ex cathedra uh, speaking on faith and morals. All of that together. But, but there's such a strong emphasis throughout the, the Catholic Church upon the magisterium, upon the bishops throughout the world coming together, even, even the Council of, of Jerusalem, right, which is in the scripture, would have been, we would have referred to as a Council of Bishops coming together. Um, and, and so then they would say, okay, well, as Catholics, we believe that there is one of the bishops that you can't seem to quite figure it out, uh, that would have the primacy, and that would be the bishop that sits in Rome. And, and, and that's, you know, you bring up even the, the Church Fathers, this is something that they did talk about a lot. That's partly why you have an Eastern Church, Eastern Orthodox, and a Western Church because of that, that very topic. And so, um, just interested in, in how you guys see uh, 
collegiality of the bishops, uh, the true primacy, what does that mean? What is the infallibility? How strong is the Pope's voice in the midst of the Catholic Church? Yeah, I guess uh, I guess that's more of a question for me, and then I'll get Ty's you know, thoughts on it. But um, you know, what I would say is that um, you know, for instance, in Acts chapter 15, Peter seems to kind of, well, Peter begins by saying, the Lord has chosen my mouth to be the one to deliver the Gentiles and to bring them into the church. And I think that's, you know, that's a pretty significant and tall claim to make right at the beginning of a council. Uh, and then I think that, too, even though James, the bishop of Jerusalem, is ultimately the one who makes the final decision because it's in his jurisdiction, because he's the bishop of that church, and then Peter eventually moves on to start his ministry with the, with the Jews in Antioch in Galatians is, uh, I pointed out. Um, you know, throughout history, the Pope hasn't always been like the head dog. And as I said, you know, he hasn't always been Rambo on doctrine and settling everything himself. Oftentimes, the Pope will just show his support. He'll be there at a council. He'll say, yeah, this has my approval. Or maybe he did not, and he rejects some things. But he's usually, you know, presided and helped out the church throughout different circumstances. There are times where the Pope has. You know, step forward, especially after Vatican I, to define ex cathedra, the Immaculate Conception, the Assumption of Mary. There have been times where the uh, Bishop of Rome has told the Eastern churches, um, no, Rome has a higher seat of authority and you have to obey us, right? But those circumstances do happen. So I'd say in response, you know, one thing to point out is with the arguments I gave last time, I provided eight parallels for Christ establishing a new rabbinic authority. I talk about how Clement of Rome acknowledges that the ministry of bishop was established by Christ from the very beginning. Uh, and then even the church fathers you cite, many of them are bishops themselves, you know, so I don't think they would want to deny their own authority, right? But, um, you know, and sometimes people will say, well, why is the Catholic Church so institutional? And I, my response would be, is because it's a kingdom. It's the Davidic kingdom rebuilt on the earth. And the Messiah is the king of our kingdom. And that's why we're structured with the bishops as it were of governor, as governors over dioceses and so on and so forth. So I would say that, you know, Peter seems to have a responsibility over the other apostles. When they fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus blames Peter. Because he's like, hey, you're supposed to watch out for your brothers. Jesus, and as I said before in my opening statement, I believe what truly matters is how Jesus viewed Peter. And, you know, as I look at the arguments and, and you know, what I presented, I think that Jesus had so much hope that Peter would be great. And I haven't lost hope in Peter either. Yeah, really good with that. <laughs> I'll share a few thoughts. Sometimes I get off track. Let me know if I am, Father Gail. Um, so just kind of to, to spitball here a little bit, um, because that seems what we're doing. Uh, I don't know. I think that a lot of times certain words get in confusion. Like this word bishop, right? I know that's thrown out a lot. Um, and that kind of seems to get muddled and mucked around with other words as well, right? Like, what is a bishop? What's, what's an elder? What's a deacon? How do these things come together? And um, I don't know. I, again, you know that I hold to soul scripture, so my starting place is scripture, right? And it's just interesting that, like, when we look at scripture, I mean, I'm just kind of trying to get my head around some of the things you mentioned. Um, but there seems to be a lack of distinction between meanings or definitions, right, of the word bishop, which comes from the word episkopos, right, and the word elder, which comes from presbyteros in the Greek terms, right, and so, so I know that often, but I know that someone who's a bishop within the Catholic Church, you wouldn't call an elder, right, um, so you kind of just, I'm just kind of getting your guys' thoughts on this, um, um, but most people would say that, like, biblically speaking, you know, there's no difference between these words, episkopos, translated bishop, or presbyteros, the word. Catholic Church would use the word presbyteros, yeah. referring many times to the priestly. Okay. So, like, would you. Like, for example, if I go to a council, council of priests, we call it a pre presbyteral council. Okay. And so, all the episcopal you know, all, the, all the, the bishops would have first been presbyteros. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just say in response to that, you know, for instance, Alistair C. Stewart has a book in 2016 titled The Original Bishops, where he kind of updates the research on the history of the bishopric. And what he points out is that um, the office of bishop, deacon, and presbyter were three separate offices in the early church. And although sometimes they're viewed interchangeably, there's a reasonable explanation why. And I mean, even in scripture, right, when Paul talks about what a bishop is required to do, he says, I think in 1 Timothy 3, 
fact check me on that. It's in Timothy somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Paul talks about how the bishop has to be able to teach, and when he talks about the deacon, he just says the deacon has to love his wife and he has to be a good guy, and so on and so forth, right? But he doesn't make the same imposition on the deacon that he does for the bishop. Yes. And then when you look at the early church, um, and especially in Alistair Stewart's research, what he points out is that the bishop was actually the head of the house church. And as you know, in the early church, they met in houses. They didn't have nice cathedrals yet. Um, and, you know, the, the, the bishop would be the head of the house church. The deacon would be the one who would help the, de uh, the bishop, right, in assisting the people. And the main reason why these offices were created were actually to help in the assistance of delivering the Eucharist. So that's why they started developing these kind of systems between house churches to distribute the Christian meal. And then the presbyter uh, is known as an elder, right, of the church. That's how they're often defined. And they were known as the patrons of the early church. So they would give money to the bishop and help him buy, you know, the wheat and the wine and so on and so forth for the Christian meal. Now, an elder could also be a bishop. So that's why sometimes you see presbyteroi, like you're talking about a bishop in one sentence, and then you switch over to talking about a, a, an elder, right? And the reason why is because a patron who supports and funds the church could also have himself been the head of a house church. So in the early church, there was a threefold distinction, but eventually, by the time of Ignatius of Antioch, who's a disciple of John, he mentions that there's a clear hierarchy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree, right, that I think we're on the same page. Bishop and an elder seem to be interchangeable in terms of the things they did, the functions and the roles they had in the New Testament. Like the, I mean, I could cite some specific sources to kind of um, back that up, but then you're right, you have deacons underneath, right? Yeah. And your elders and your bishops specifically for being teaching. Um, now, I haven't answered this question yet, I'm sorry. How did, um, how did Jesus view Peter, right? That, yeah. That's how we want to view Peter. And, um, I mean, as he asked that question, like, immediately I just think of passages like the Transfiguration. Right? I think of passages like uh, when Jesus goes and heals uh, Jairus, the synagogue leader's 12-year-old daughter who's, you know, dead and then not dead anymore. Um, <laughs> that, that Jesus always has, like, a posse of, like, his closest clan seems to be the threefold, right? Like, Peter, James, and John. And that's what it seems like Paul indicates, too, in Galatians 2, 9, like, saying, like, these are the pillars of the church. And so it seems as if, like, and, and John then would call himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, mm -hmm. right, throughout the last few chapters of the book of John. And so it seems as if there was kind of, I don't know if you'd call it an inner circle, right, but a group of people who maybe got more access to the life and ministry of Jesus, yeah than the rest of the other yeah, 12, the other 9 apostles, right? Um, but I, I honestly don't see this, this idea of Peter receiving more attention. Um, again, I know you point to passages you did, you know, in chapter 22, 31, 32. Can I ask you about your interpretation of Luke 22? Because I was kind of... Um, yeah, I went through it quick. Go ahead, for sure. Yeah, well, you know, so in that passage, right, Jesus is saying that Satan is going after all the apostles. Yes. And rather than praying that all the apostles are protected from Satan. Jesus says, Peter, once you turn back, strengthen your brothers. So, I mean, you know, why not Jesus pray to protect all the apostles? Or, what, you know, why does Jesus entrust caring for the other apostles to Peter in that particular passage? Well, surely you don't presume that Jesus didn't pray for the other apostles, would you? Well, yeah, of course he prayed for the other apostles, but here he seems to isolate Peter from the rest as taking care of his brothers. Yeah. No, he, I mean, he clearly does, right? Right, yeah. So I'll just, I think you iterated clearly, but just to kind of voice what Swan's saying, this passage in Luke 22, right, Simon says, or Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, if you is plural. He's like talking to the 12. Simon, right. Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, the 12, as we. And he goes back and pray for you, and then you becomes singular. Peter, right? Your faith may not fail. Um, and again, I, I, I don't see the fact that praying for one individual means that that individual has privacy. We have a prayer meeting at our church uh, once a week, and um, I don't think it would be proper to say the first person prayed for is the one who has privacy within our congregation. And just to kind of tease that out a little bit, I know that wasn't, yeah. you know, that's just kind of just a little trick example. I think there's just a lot that's being imported and read to them. Like, I don't think someone would read that text and go, oh, Peter actually has more authority. I think that's something that seems to be interpretations had with already previously held belief. And so what I would say is that when we look later, Peter denies Jesus three times. 
the thing that no other 11 do. And so when Peter is sitting there in misery and shambles, right, the torment of his soul, says he went outside and wept bitterly, I think he can sit here and remember that promise that Jesus gave, that I have prayed for you. Because none of the other 12 denied Jesus. And so I think there's this cool bit there that allows Peter to hold on to and remember that which Jesus said, oh, he prayed for me, which allows Peter to then kind of pick himself up, get the gumption, and be like, oh, Jesus still loves, he will preserve and hold on to me. Well, yeah. so, so that's how I would kind of describe and define why that singular I pray for you exists. Yeah, and I think that just, to, to, to maybe we'll go about two more minutes in the dialogue component, and then I think you both wanted to do a five-minute closing statement. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Compared to last time, we're like a lot calmer. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Come on, this is like I said. We want to do this right. We want to teach right. the world how dialogue should be. And, and when was the last time somebody screamed you into changing your mind? Right? It doesn't happen. And so, not that there was screaming, but there was firm argumentation last time. I like this better. Uh, dialogue. So, uh, is that true? Though five minute closing statements. Yeah. So maybe let's let's just go three more minutes of. Uh, Dialogue, and then, and then we'll turn to closing statements. And we'll get those Swan first, and then you tie. Is that yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. What well, What I want to do is just read Luke twenty two thirty one to thirty two again. So it says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to see, sift each of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So I mean, you know. Of course, Jesus prays for all the apostles, but then he uses but to contrast that he's now singling out Peter. And then he says, I pray that your faith may not fail, in the singular. And then he says, when once you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. So, I mean, I'm happy. So, how do you, okay, so you interpreted uh, Jesus telling Peter to strengthen his brothers. It's just something that everybody does, right? Of course. Okay. So then, I, mean, I think that's a command that's, that's given other places in Scripture also strengthen the brothers, using that exact same Greek verse to read so yeah. of strength. But then when Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. I mean, that's, that's a strange thing for Jesus to pray over just Peter, but not the rest of the apostles. I don't think so, say? considering the, the foreknowledge that Jesus sure. had, yeah. right? Because, I mean, Peter said, um, you know, Jesus, those prayers must not have been very effective in this uh, situation. <laughs> 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 yeah, quite interesting, right? Um, that, that's a whole other I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right now. Uh, but I, I think that we don't see any of the other 11 that deny Jesus three times. And so again, right. I think there's spe specific petitional prayer given because Jesus' foreknowledge is able to know that, man, Peter's going to be in this tough, rough place, and he's going to be in this agony of soul kind of thing. And when he gets there, I want him to be able to remember Christ prayed for me. I'll just read a quick sure. little insert about um, what a scholar has to say. And by the way, I'm going to ask you Forget about one minute and 15 seconds. I want you to have a last word time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, well, I was just going to read a quick little quote here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want that to be the last word. It's going to be pretty unepic. <laughs> That's all right. But just a, a quick quotation here. It says, has everything to do... This passage has everything to do with the power of God to keep his own, even in the midst of despair. Satan desires to test the disciples. He does all the things. Jesus warns Peter that he, more than anyone else, as I mentioned, stands in danger because of his rash tongue, etc. So Jesus proved, provides a promise with the warning. The Lord of glory himself is praying for Peter so that his faith would not fail. Not because of anything special about Peter, but because of the providential power of Christ himself. Yeah, I think, okay, I think that's a reasonable counterinterpretation to that passage. Um, of course, you know, that I would bring in also the other Petrine Primacy text to start isolating that. For instance, like, um, when in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, when uh, the disciples fall asleep, and then Jesus is like, Peter, why have, like, why have you let your brothers fall asleep? I mean, that, that seems to clearly imply to me that Peter was viewed as take responsible for his brothers, especially in that instance or circumstance. What would you think about that? Uh, it's... Actually, that's not one that I've specifically thought of, so it's going to be just kind of, you know, thinking off my feet. Yeah. Um, can this be the, the last word on this then, and then we'll go to the closing sure. statements? And also, yeah. yeah. Can we do the closing statements sitting down? I, don't, I, like, I like this. I feel like this. Hey, you choose. You want to sit? You sit? You, you want to stand? You stand? You're the Jewish guy. You're the Israeli guy. <laughs>
I'm clearly not Jewish. Oh, yeah. You're sitting on the throne of Moses, right? <laughs> Just piece of furniture. From 1961. This thing, look at this. Yeah, so what do you think about that particular instance? Again, I, I think that you have to bring a large amount of freight in in order to come to the conclusion that there's privacy. I, I do. I mean, I just I don't think someone reads that text, and I'm not going to read it for you. I know we're closing down on time here, but as Jesus goes away and prays the garden, comes back, it's like, I don't think anyone reads that text and comes to the conclusions that Vatican I put, that he is the head of church militant, right? He is vicar of Christ. He stands in the place of Christ. I don't think you, you don't get that conclusion. Well, but, but as you know, right, when you build doctrine, you have to go slowly with the scriptures and just kind of create probabilistic arguments, right? So Exactly, yeah. but you, you can't create a probabilistic argument when your church has created a definite dogma that anathematizes those who so don't believe in. Right, I don't, I don't see like, that. This is sure. a probable so, so, yeah. right? yeah. We're talking something that is definitely held to be the case. And I don't think that this contributes or alludes to, honestly, that conclusion. That's great. So that's good. Uh, right. I think that's uh, sufficient for one day's dialogue. And we'll now go to uh, closing statements. What do I do? Do I, do I sit here while you're sitting there? Yeah, you, you sit there. It's nodding my head. Like, well, wow, nice argument. I'm not the same with that. Nice, nice argument. All right. Well, yeah, let me begin by once again thanking everyone for coming out to this debate. I want to thank Ty for just the really excellent arguments, and there was so much that could be said tonight, and we didn't get to it, so I hope that this opens up dialogue, and I hope that um, Ty continues his studies, and I hope that I continue my studies, and Ty, I, hope, I wish you well as you pursue your master's degree, and I can't wait to see what you do for the kingdom. Um, in response, I just want to say that I don't think I'm particularly convinced by the arguments that Ty has given tonight, so I said something nice, now I've got to get down to business. <laughs> So, for instance, in, the, in my opening statement, I mentioned the fact that Christ is the Messiah, and that to be the Messiah implies kingship, and that particularly Jesus is the new Adam. We both agree Jesus is the new Moses. That's what granted my arguments last time for the eight parallels on Christ establishing the Sanhedrin, and that Jesus is the new David. And what I wanted to argue is that with Peter being the new Eliakim in Matthew 16, 19, Isaiah 22, 22, aside from whether or not there's a distinction between key singular or keys plural, I don't think that's very substantial. I think the bigger question is whether or not, for instance, we see um, a, a similar structure, as I pointed out, or whether or not we see other similarities between Peter and Eliakim. The other five points that I made I don't think were addressed tonight. Uh, and when it comes to the rest of the argument, I think we have pretty solid grounds for believing that if Christ is the son of David, and he's destined to bring the kingdom of God and establish it on the earth, then he's going to structure his church like his father's kingdom, King David's kingdom. So to have a Davidic prime minister seems totally appropriate. And as I, as I mentioned already, um, in response to uh, you know, Ty's arguments, for instance, he's, he's proposing that, well, maybe uh, you know, Peter could, uh, is not, you know, Peter's confession is the rock, but also we have uh, Jesus being the rock. I mentioned not only is that not the consensus of New Testament scholars today, although he is right that there are some who continue to persist against that opinion, I mentioned four arguments from the original Greek and the language itself, or even the Jewish sources that talk about how Abraham is the rock upon which God built the old congregation. So I think that those arguments weren't addressed tonight. And I think that you know, if you want to say, sure, that you know, well, if you want to say that uh, Christ is the rock, then for instance, uh, I think it was Martin R. Vincent, he mentioned the fact that you know, Christ's declaration is mirroring Peter's declaration. So when Peter says, "Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the Living God." Christ uses the same structure and flips it and says, and thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. So there's, aside from the Greek language, there's the grammar of the sentence itself, there's the vast majority of scholars today. You have top evangelicals just saying, guys, we have to stop saying that Peter is not the rock, that Pete, the person of Peter is not the rock of the church. When it comes to Peter being the new Joshua, I also, you know, that basically was dropped tonight, and I, I know that probably happened because of time. Right, but I think that there's something pretty substantial there when you have top Lutheran scholars who know the original sources that surround the New Testament, they're saying, wait, Jesus is the new Moses and Peter's the new Joshua, and they would have seen Peter then in the early church as seated on the throne of Moses. And we also know from the early Christian art that Peter was portrayed as the new Moses. Um, in certain, I think, frescoes in the Vatican, you can see that clearly being made. And then also I mentioned the fact that, um, let's see here, that Peter received the throne of Moses, the Acts 5 argument never came up again. I thought that was unfortunate. And then I also mentioned the fact that 
Even though the church fathers disagreed on the extent of Peter's authority, they never disagreed that Peter had um, that Peter had successors, and that wasn't addressed either. Now, for instance, the, the Lutheran professor Marcus Bachmiel at Oxford acknowledges this, or even the fact that Rome mattered because the Jews believed that if the Messiah was going to come, he was going to do something with Rome. So then I wanted to kind of press time on that, but we ran out of time, on what did the Messiah, according to you, do to Rome? Because if we're going to talk to our Jewish brothers and sisters and ask them, you know, hey, this is, Jesus is the Messiah, they're going to say, okay, what did he do with Rome? Did he build a new Sanhedrin? Did he bring the kingdom of David? And in our ministry to our Jewish brothers and sisters, you want to say, yeah, Jesus is the Messiah, and he built a kingdom on the earth. Um, when it comes to some of the arguments with respect to the church fathers, the reason why I didn't like, engage that too much is because the church fathers, you know, they, they say a lot of things, but one of the things that I wanted to point out is that the earliest church fathers, for instance, Irenaeus mentions the fact that Peter has uh, successors in Rome. And Irenaeus is, the reason why Irenaeus matters is also because if it weren't for him, we wouldn't know who was the author of the Gospel of John, because he explicitly says, John is the author of that gospel. And moreover, uh, Irenaeus talks about how every church should obey this church in Rome in his letter against heresies. So sure, the early church fathers had disagreements, but even over time, you see that in the early church councils, the bishop of Rome was always put in a position of presiding over the council, of making sure it was justified, and I think like other doctrines that they proceed developed. My clock to check to make sure that that was actually five minutes. It was. It did beat on the five minutes. It doesn't have some phone that automatically. <laughs> <laughs> did you have that prepared? I thought about it. <laughs> oh, oh. That's something. All right, I'll go ahead and begin my statement as well. I'll just try to respond to a few quick points that Swan gave, give kind of uh, a final few thoughts to have. So. Uh, Swan gave three arguments to start the night. Peter is a new Eliakim. Peter is, excuse me, Peter is a new Eliakim. Yes, Peter is a new Joshua. Peter's successors are the bishops of Rome. I, I think he would agree that all three of these arguments need to stand in order for his conclusion to stand of the institution, the legitimacy, and the papacy, and bishops uh, being successors. It's almost like the Jenga thing, right? If you pull one out, they all fall. And he, he really honestly didn't engage with what I thought is kind of the biggest uh, difficulty that exists with this statement that Peter is the new Eliakim. He completely relies upon a text in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 19 to 25, um, that again, as I mentioned, has no patristic backing in order to actually connect that text to Matthew 16. But I think the saddest part is that he didn't at all deal with the fact that Jesus himself interprets this text in a way that is completely antithetical to the way that Swan does. Again, I read Revelation 3, 7. It says, And to the angel of Philadelphia, right, this is Jesus himself speaking, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, exact quotation, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open. Jesus is saying, again, that he holds this key. Present tense. Swan's entire argument depends upon the fact that that key is given to Peter. And it's alluding to and it's referencing to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. Jesus did not view this text of the Old Testament as doing exactly that. Again, Swan seems to say that, well, the Greek makes it clear throughout all of Matthew 16 that Peter himself is the rock. Again, if that's the case, it really perplexes me to think why the early church fathers, which were Greek-speaking, might I add, didn't actually think that or take that view. I know we don't need to get into an argument of what every single church father believes. I didn't get into quoting them all. I just wanted to show the fact that it's not the consensus. It's not the ancient, unchanging faith. It's not that which has always been held throughout the entirety of the church age, as Rome dogmatically claims it is in Vatican I. Vatican I clearly says that this isn't just something that developed, but that this is something that has been the consensus view. And even Council Trent says that we cannot interpret anything except that which is unanimous with the consent of the early church fathers. And yet in this interpretation of Matthew 16, Rome is condemning itself by going against the very interpretation that is the consensus of the early church fathers. Again, I know that you say a lot of Protestant scholars say that Peter is the rock. Absolutely, completely, 
Now, I'll just quote one real quick, Matthew Bruner, um, who refers to this, but I want to point your attention to something in particular. is that they don't view Peter as having an office that is transferable. They're simply saying that Peter is a rock, uh, means something that he's probably pretty important, and he is. Right? Like we read the Acts 2, he's the first one to open up the kingdom. He is the one who Paul calls the one to go to the circumcised. Right? Um, he does have a pretty large part in the gospel of Acts, uh, sorry, in the, the book of Acts, especially throughout uh, the first half. Right? But here's what Matthew Bruner says. He says, the uniqueness and historical once for allness of Peter's commission as a rock. The text does not say, on this rock and on his successors, I will build my church. Rather, it speaks to solus petrus. There is your Latin for the day. To take this text literally is to honor Peter only. Right? So all of the Protestants that he's bringing to the table don't actually say that it's an office that can then be transferred with a perpetual line of successors. Rather, they say it's Peter, Peter only, once for all, unique in all this time, which isn't the view that the Catholic Church holds. And, uh, I just want to remind you real quick of a text that I referred to a lot in my first debate, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says that Scripture makes one fully equipped for every good work. And I think, honestly, that what Swan is presenting implicitly says something somewhat to the contrary. Okay? Not that I'm against bringing in other academics, but he says, using sources such as the Midrash, the Richard, the Sifra uh, Musha, the Petra Musha, right? That he's almost implying that all of you guys need to know these sources in order to come to the conclusions that he does. And if you don't know those sources, then you yourself cannot come to these conclusions. As if the Bible alone, just holding it and reading it, doesn't actually get you to the papacy, but when you include all this first century Roman stuff, it does. Jesus says that God has revealed himself to the simple, and that he has hidden himself from the wise and the learned. And it seems like Swan is saying, no, God completely reveals himself only to the learned and to the wise who have access to all of this first century Palestinian context that most of us don't want, especially those in, say, persecuted church. And so I just encourage you to kind of think on maybe those exhortations as we finish up tonight. Thank you. So I just want to thank the both of you again for being a part of this series. I know we're going to meet again in, in two weeks. Uh, very clear, I think, where both Swan and Ty stand uh, in regards to the Pope. Uh, maybe just uh, just a brief follow-up. What do you think, uh, Ty, about the uh, Pope Mobile? Because <laughs> I think something special. Bulletproof uh, glass. Yeah, check it out. Google that. The Pope Mobile. <laughs> it's something. Uh, it's, it's I didn't learn about the Pope Mobile no. reading back in one or two. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> didn't exist. My no. Check it out. All right. Well, bless you all. Thank you all for coming, and uh, pray that you have a safe night, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank <laughs> you.